few years back, I bit the bullet and left my cushy nine to five to open my food dream. It was a chance encounter with the Belgian patisserie that changed everything for me. It's our chance to hatch our plan B out of the corporate life. Arriba! Because I love food. Now, I'm sharing my favourite recipes and searching for other passionate people to tell me their stories. In the last episode of this series of Passion Food, we thought it only appropriate to end on a sweet note. I visit two very accomplished women with their own cake business, a very nutty duo, a beer and dessert pairing, and I make my most popular cake. Festival of Chocolate in the Rocks, Sydney, is Australia's biggest two-day celebration of sweet indulgences from donuts to gelato, chocolate sculptures and truffles. This is the best place on earth to ditch your diet. I can't imagine a better place to be than in Sydney. It's being held at the Rocks and sponsored by Smooth FM. Let's go and taste some chocolate. Inside the Chocolatier's tent, Calibo Chocolate donated 150 kilograms of chocolate to be made into an amazing steampunk themed sculpture titled Bone Shaker. Made entirely of chocolate. And it's actually going to work. And back outside, this is a cool one. Donuts, donuts for dogs. 11-year-old Marcus came up with the business idea so he could save money to buy a dog of his own. How cute. Yeah, that's really cool. Being an entrepreneur at 12 or 11, that's really impressive. I was excited to talk with Sina from Nutty Donuts in Balmain, who makes the most amazing and indulgent vegan and gluten-free donuts. They also make other products like ice cream sandwiches and brownies. They all left me feeling pretty tempted to go vegan. These are all handmade and decorated with high quality ingredients and toppings. Mm -hmm. And the rosewater and pistachio one is our all time most popular donut. Every event we do, that's like oh. what sells first. That's what wow. people that try it for the first time go for. Okay. The raspberry, because it's, you know, your classic pink donut, mm -hmm. and it's also dairy free. And then we brought two vegan donuts, a Snickers, and then a deluxe couch potato. Wow, okay. And um, so we kind of got these three things going today. Mm -hmm. Everything we do right. is always gluten free, but we just tried focusing really hard on vegan with this because we're just building up our following with that and everyone's wow. asking for it. If going vegan means eating these kinds of quality treats, then I may just stand a chance. Finished with the festival and boy was it smooth. I'll head out to some cake shops for my next adventure. bit of a girl power episode, I must admit, because I'm visiting two of my favourite professional women in the industry. First up is Faye Carhill of Faye Carhill Cake Designs. Located in Marrickville, an inner city suburb of Sydney, is where her studio is. What we have at the front here, um, all of our display cakes, so everything that you see in the window is usually just our props for, um, for showing customers, for taking to wedding fairs, that sort of thing. And then back here we have all of our real cakes that we're working on. She's known for her beautifully custom-made wedding cakes, edible lacework, bespoke designs and custom handmade sugar flowers. Um, Rebecca's working on one that's all white on white with three different lace patterns and then we have the champagne one over here. I asked about the flowers I saw hanging upside down like little delicate white teardrops. So yeah, we specialise in sugar flowers, so they're, they're all made out of gum paste, which is a mixture of um, sugar, gelatin, egg white. It sets really hard and um, you can get it really fine, so um, the idea is that they look, they look quite fine and natural, so every, every petal is rolled out by hand. Um, we, we do them all here. Wow. Yeah. She makes her own stencils and that allows her to be creative and a little bit different. But how does it taste? That's what I wanted to know. 
What we like to do is customise things a lot more. So, for example, if you look at this tier here, um, we have some flexible lace. So, what that is is a product. And it's um, yeah, yeah. So it's a really cool product. It's it's fairly new, I guess. It's been around for a little while, but it's sort of one of the newer products, and it actually looks a lot like real lace. So it's um, it's a mix that you make up. <laughs> How's it <laughs> taste? Like sugar. Yeah, it's um, lace and sugar. So we make that up, and then we just spread that over the stencil. Um, I can show you how we do that if you like. Would love that. And then all we're doing is uh, scraping that across the surface of the stencil. And do you let it dry or do you pull it off when it's wet? No, we'll pull that off as soon as we're finished working with it and that's, that's while it's wet. I love getting involved and having a go at cool new techniques. So no pressure, but this yeah. is a real wedding cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm ready. Is that right? Yeah, nice. That's looking great. I always ice in a blue dress, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I really admire Faye for the niche she's created in the market. She's also an author, a teacher of classes all around the world. And I asked Faye, why does she do it? And what she loves most about making cakes. Um, I really like the variety, just working on new things all the time. You're never doing the same thing over and over and just basically seeing new trends come through, different inspiration material, um, working with different clients. So um, it's just nice working on the range of weddings that we do. So, it, you know, everything from like big opulent grand things to little quirky fun things. I also asked if I could have a go at creating her petite, delicate sugar flowers. So, it's quite interesting when I do it, I feel like a bull in a china shop. Like that. Beautiful. And twist around. Yeah, so just get the ends meeting each other. There we go. I don't know about that, but... Oh. Beautiful. Oh, that's perfect. Not Looks bad lovely. For my first time. Yeah, very nice. Will this go on a wedding cake? Yeah, it will. <laughs> Not bad. Yay, thank you. Beautiful, <laughs> thank you. I asked Faye how she got into it, and it turns out she was going to school for design and worked part-time in cake shops. She married the two ideas together, and wham bam, a beautiful combo of art, design, and cake was born. While I was at art school, I was working behind the counter in, in bakeries, so um, just basically serving customers. Um, but I, I later fell into the baking side of things, and then from there, um, I fairly quickly I found a role in decorating and specialising in wedding cakes. So I was working in um, some commercial studios in, in Sydney, and then um, I was doing that for a number of years, and then went out on my own and opened my current business. It's been good. Well, you certainly do an amazing job here. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. Oh, thank you for coming in. We're in Milton, Queensland, to meet Matt, educator and beer aficionado. Hey, Gillian, how are you? Good, how are you going? Good. Lovely to see you. Nice to see you as well. Welcome to Newstead Brewing. Great. Can I come in? Let's have a look around. Matt owns and runs Brews News, an informative and passionate blog all about beer and the beer industry. Matt is so passionate about beer and educating anyone who will listen as to why beer is more than just a refreshing slammer after work. I got him to take me on his favourite haunts for a beer tour. Boy, that made me very happy. Enter Newstead Brewing Co. And I was lucky enough to meet the head brewer who holds it down like a boss. Also an awesome female head brewer, Carrie took us behind the scenes for a scientific explanation of how to brew a good one. The four key ingredients are grains, mostly malted barley, hops, yeast and water. 
and how long it takes to make a beer. So this whole process um, takes around about five to six hours, depending on the beer that we're making. Um, Quicker than I thought, actually. Yeah, yeah, but the whole process of making beer is, is generally around two weeks for an ale-style beer, uh, usually around four, four weeks if you're gonna make a lager-style beer. Um, but yeah, this is where I guess the, the blood, sweat and tears happens <laughs> uh, in this first sort of five, six hours of the process. And then we just let the yeast do its thing after that. Have a party. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. She took me to the cool room where the beer taps pull from. Obviously you need to make sure that the beer is flowing through the system, hence we've got our little sight glasses. Mm -hmm. But it allows you to see all those lovely colours of the beers and all the different varieties that we actually yeah, serve here at Newstead. I love it. And so when someone pours it from the tap, this is where it's coming from. Yeah, and someone's that, doing it now. That's, that's exactly Ooh. right. You can hear that clicking, it's actually drawing it from out of the keg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> really cool. Really, I mean like really cool, like I'm cold. Woo. Yeah. I have to admit, I firmly, solidly believe that drinking my beer from glass bottles tastes more refreshing than a can but I was given a proverbial slap on the hand as Kerry explains why right. they don't. Yeah, so in a bottle, um, basically the beer is exposed to UV light. You put beer into a nice dark environment, which is a can, it's not gonna be exposed to any of that UV light. It's actually also better for air tightness. Um, obviously in a can, you get very little leakage from the, from the actual can, whereas um, the, the bottles are prone to actually, or prone to actually leak from the crown itself. Um, so yeah, nice dark wow. environment, it keeps the, the beer um, airtight um, and at the end of the day we always say it doesn't really matter whether it comes in a bottle or a can you should actually always pour your beer into a glass oh, exactly okay. right it's part of the sensory experience of enjoying the beer so I guess three things we, we work really hard as brewers to try and get right is the color the clarity and the foam of the beer two of which I note are the same qualities used to grade diamonds. Well, that'll be easy for me to remember. So buying yourself a nice glass, having a nice beer glass and pouring your beer into that glass, not only allows you to appreciate those things that we've worked so hard to, to actually get right, mm -hmm. it also starts that sensory experience with the beer. You get to see it, you get to actually put your nose in, smell all those lovely hop aromas before actually enjoying the, the beer itself. And also, I guess, especially for, for myself being a woman, it's, it's I love it because because it actually dissipates a lot of the carbon dioxide from the beer, ah. stops you feeling less, uh, it make, make, makes it less bluted. So, um, you know, get you rid of That's yeah. right, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the things that I'm so proud to represent Newstead. It's a family owned business. Um, it's, it's Brisbane all the way, uh, Brisbane owned, Brisbane produced, a Brisbane packaged product. Everything about us is local in Brisbane. So it doesn't mean that people have to come and support Newstead, but obviously supporting uh, your, your local uh, brewery or uh, local bar is, is I think key to making sure that our um, industry is sustainable into the future. Keeping it close to home. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next up, we did a beer pairing with foods and desserts at the Port Office Hotel and Restaurant in Brisbane CBD. We went into their wine room for a beer tasting. Funnily enough, it worked. So we're going to have a bit of fun with this, Jill. G'day, John. Uh, now, tell Jillian what we've got here. We have some Marimbula rock oysters from mm -hmm. Sydney Coast Wine. Lovely. So you'll find them small, creamy and plump. Very nice. For you to enjoy. Now I know that you're not a huge fan of dark beers, but we're going to start with that one. Now, because we're drinking beer, um, we're, we're using a wine glass, not because we want to be wearing cravats and we're getting all hoity-toity, <laughs> but the glasses are the same. It does let us give the glass a bit of a swirl. Do you really do that for beer? We're tasting today. You're not going to go out into the front bar of your local and start swirling your beer. Somebody will say something unkind. <laughs> but here we are tasting. So we do want to uh, actually get some of those aromas up because a lot of what we perceive is flavour. I tasted the oyster and the dark beer together. I'm still not a fan of the oyster or the beer, but it's good to have the experience. Oh, wow. The main experience for me was the pairing of the beer with desserts. And we have three to try. Now that's my kind of beer pairing. Oh, yum. See, and I'm going to open this one because we're going to have a little bit of fun with this. This is a beer, believe it or not, but wow. you tuck into that. So we get to have a bit of theatre with this one. Mm. It is really quite complex. Oh, yeah. 
I learned a lot from Matt, mostly. Take your beer seriously, just don't take yourself seriously while you're doing it because yeah. that takes all of the fun out of it. Cheers. Cheers. So we're gonna make a red velvet cake. It's a very easy cake to make because you mix the wet ingredients all together, you mix all of the dry ingredients together, and then you mix the two of them and you pop it in the oven. It's really simple. People ask me, what makes the red velvet cake so red? Is it beetroot? Is it something mystical that happens in a chemical reaction? No, unfortunately not. And I hate to dispel this myth, but it's red food coloring. So that's what we're gonna make today. It's gonna be absolutely beautiful. The colors when you mix the red velvet cake with the beautiful white creamy vanilla bean icing is just spectacular. So if you're looking for something that will absolutely pop at a dinner party, this is the go-to cake. Start with flour and add your sugar. We have some salt and some cocoa powder. Mix it all together. Pop it in the mixer. We're gonna get all of the wet ingredients now. So this is a really interesting ingredient to put in a cake. We have buttermilk. What it does with the cake is it makes the cake a lot more tender. So that's my secret to having really beautiful, tender red velvet cake. Pour in your buttermilk, egg, oil, and vanilla. And sorry folks, but the red food colouring's gotta go in. And that's it, that's all there is to it. You just mix this together makes it a really beautiful, vibrant red color. And now you just put the wet ingredients into the dry ingredients. Now, you're gonna to wanna to put it on speed one or the lowest setting that you can because you've got a lot of wet ingredients in there. And if you put it on any higher, it's just gonna go all over the kitchen. You're gonna have a completely red face, clothes, workbench, everything, and you'll be cleaning for days, and that won't be good. This is the consistency that you're looking for when you're making a red velvet cake. It's got a really beautiful, smooth, pouring consistency, almost like a pancake batter. So divide your batter equally into all three tins. If you don't want to use three tins, just fill up one tin and at the end, you'll have a nice high cake and you'll just cut that cake into three separate layers. Bake for approximately 20 minutes. Now, to be able to have really beautiful straight layers like you see in the cake shops, you need to take a knife and level each one of these layers off. Then we'll start the process of icing the layers. Keep the offcuts to bake and make into crumbs for your garnish. If you don't want to make the red velvet crumbs, what you can do with it is the next best option. <laughs> Actually, it's probably the best option, really. Take a few scoops of your favourite vanilla bean or cream cheese icing. Or, if it's easier, pipe the icing on with a piping bag. Smooth your icing with a palette knife and stack your layers evenly. You'll want to crumb coat your cake to seal in the moisture. Give the hypnotizing swirl for effect and cover the bottom edge of your cake with your dried crumbs. Voila, my bright, beautiful, moist, ruby red velvet cake. So good.
On the northern beaches of Sydney, there's another amazing woman that I admire in this industry, Gigi Falanga. I She's know. a very talented you? pastry no, chef, no, TV no, presenter no. on Zimbo's Just Desserts, and a new kids show called Get Arty. She's gonna show me a few cool techniques. So I love to make cakes in general. I like to do celebration cakes, wedding cakes, and I just thought I should show you a glazing technique. Okay. Something that I love to do, and that's different ways and colors that we can achieve the final result on the cake. Yeah, so glaze is it's the icing, let's say, like that. A glaze is a smooth, shiny, pourable icing for cakes. We're gonna cover some mousse cakes with different types of glazes. So what I did here, I layered this uh, mousse cake with different fillings. This one's coconut, passion fruit, and milk chocolate mousse. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I like to glaze using a support, that's like just a milk jug, or you can use the cooling rack as well. So my cake's been in the freezer for 24 hours. Okay. Just to make sure it's solid, hard, and cold. Mm -hmm. Gigi warms and tempers the chocolate glaze to make it pourable. And then I go around the edges. Okay. Ready? Mm -hmm. Ooh. Ooh, look! Yeah. Oh, it's gorgeous! Ah. Just kind of like let it drip a bit. Wow. <laughs> How nice is it dripping? Eh? It's beautiful. Once it stops dripping, she'll scrape the bottom edge for a smooth finish. That looks so pretty even on its own. <laughs> it is, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes, you know, you don't really need the decoration. Just the way it is, it's beautiful. Then we got to play with some unconventional tools. Fun, I say. <laughs> Oh, look, oh, it's like wow. a honeycomb. Oh, that's isn't amazing. It? So I just spread the chocolate over a bubble wrap. Oh. And that's it, that's it. Even oh, the sound. Oh, it's lovely. I just want to crush it. Yeah. Yeah. Go to the oh. <laughs> So that's pretty cool, huh? Oh, I love it. I love so it. I chocolate is something it. so good to work with. You can uh, play um, in different ways and always going to be very effective. This one I just temper it and I put over a paper mm -hmm. and with my hands I hold the chocolate like that to wow. set. So that takes like two to three minutes and then we remove the plastic and we have this beautiful... Oh, that's incredible. Shine, How do you think of things like this, Gigi? Oh, you just get inspirations, I think. You just, you know, there's people out there doing some amazing stuff, so you just look at what people do and mm -hmm. you just start playing around and then, you know, your ideas are going to come up and you want to look at something that's textural and then you want to play with and then sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like we can let's start this one. We mm -hmm. can just pop in the cake like this. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. And that's ready. <laughs> <laughs> it's done. <laughs> then it was my turn. So you trust me with this? I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you said start in the centre yeah. and then go, go around, around in yeah. one fell. If we see we don't have mm -hmm. enough glaze, I'm going to stay next to you and I can always scrape the glaze on the side. Okay, so you'll be my backup. Yeah, otherwise you can leave some drips up on the, on the side as well. Beautiful. Done. Thank you. Woohoo! You. I went straight for the bubble wrap. And there. finished yeah. with a sprinkling mm -hmm. of gold luster dust. Yeah, here you go. Just give it a different touch, huh? Yeah. Love it. <laughs> Moving on to the colourful effect of marbling. I think she matched my dress perfectly. And I had a coconut d'aqua. Mm. I have mango jelly and passion fruit brulee. Oh, that sounds yeah. amazing. Sounds very tropical. Yeah, exactly. So Love those it. are the flavours of Brazil. Uh, is this tropical? Mostly, what reminds yeah. me of Brazil a lot. Doce de leite is definitely a really popular flavor. Mm -hmm. Passion fruit, mango. Yeah, I guess it is very Brazilian. <laughs> she pours all three colors into one jug in the center of each one. Orange, white, and yellow. Same temperature, same consistency. Oh, we're so excited. <laughs> the moment of truth. Oh, that's incredible! 
and only one white chocolate curly Q to garnish. Perfect. What a special day with a gorgeous, talented chef. We have maroon viola oyster, so Sydney rock oyster, um, small cream and pump. <laughs> do you do a, or just, uh, maybe just one, just one? Okay. <laughs> you don't know me that well. So. <laughs> Afterwards, well, yeah. <laughs> okay. So this is the end of Passion Food TV's first series. It's been so much fun. I can't wait for season two to see what we get up to, the friends we're gonna meet, the food we're gonna taste. It's gonna be incredible and very full of passion.